Now, this takes us into our next session, SMEs paving the way to a sustainable economy. During this discussion, our panelists will outline the importance of SMEs to future growth and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals by highlighting the actions local business leaders are taking to strengthen the resilience of their communities to withstand future shocks and will raise awareness of key asks of multinational businesses and governments from this critical constituency that will help to make supply chains more inclusive and sustainable. But before we start the panel, I am pleased to welcome several keynote remarks addressing this important issue. First, we will hear from two global finance and trade leaders for their insight on sustainable finance and the role of SMEs. Please welcome Maktar Diop as Managing Director of the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, which is the private sector of the World Bank, followed by Pamela Koch Hamilton, the Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Mr. Diop, over to you. We all know how important small business are for the global economy. They create jobs, they left uh, family out of poverty, they invigorate communities, and nowhere they are more important than in developing countries, where small businesses are responsible for 90% of new employment opportunities and up to 70% of GDP. COVID-19 dealt a devastating blow to these economic engines. Business closed, job lost, supply chain disrupt. The full economic cost of the pandemic is hard to comprehend, let alone address. But address it we must, with urgency, creativity, and shared purpose. Our first priority must be improving access to capital. As we know, this is not a new issue. Financing has always been the biggest constraint on business growth in developing countries, with owners and entrepreneurs saying it's one of the toughest challenges, often outranking electricity shortages and other concerns. In fact, the most recent data tell us that the financing gap for micro, small and medium enterprises in emerging markets is nearly three trillion dollars, and that was before the pandemic. The gap is almost certainly larger today. This means that small businesses had little to no buffer to help them weather the storm. And the financial institution that were best positioned to help these enterprises quickly encounter their own liquidity concerns. Supporting small businesses in the developing world has always been a priority for IFC. But this overwhelming need created by the pandemic demanded that we step forward in new and decisive ways. With COVID-19 dragging Africa in its first economic recession in 25 years, IFC committed $1 billion in new direct financing for MSMEs on the continent. We also launched $400 million global initiative to help financial service providers deliver funding to small businesses, informal enterprises, and low-income households hit hardest by the pandemic. The first loan under our base of the pyramid program is helping Kazakhstan leading micro-institution KMF LLC support 217,000 customers who mostly live in rural and remote areas. In a country like Kazakhstan, where small businesses account for more than a quarter of economic growth, such support is vital for economic re uh, recovery. This is only the beginning of IFC support to MSMEs. As we look to the future, we will be particularly focused on using our new investment to regain ground on gender equity. With countless women forced out of labor market and into unpaid work during the pandemic, we must act quickly, if only we are going to save a generation of female entrepreneurs. But there is a limit to what IFC or any one institution can do to meet this sheer volume of needs that is out there. We must work together, 
And if you are going to have small businesses return to where they were before the pandemic. What can this look like? The height of the crisis revealed a number of innovative examples that we can build on. In the public sector space, several countries introduced emerging loans and more flexible repayment terms for existing loans. Traditional and non-traditional financial institutions also step up in the way they are doing things. Fintechs were able to use the wealth of data at their disposal to help government agencies and other financial institutions better determine the health of businesses before the downturn started, so that relief could flow to enterprises that were likely to bounce back quickly and start hiring workers again. One thing is clear, developing economies won't be able to build back, much less build back better without dedicated, coordinated, small business support from governments, in financial institutions and the private sector. If we succeed, we will be able to weave a net that cash she's MSMEs before they fall through the crack forever. And the global economy will be better uh, out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Excellencies, Excellencies distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning to all of you. It is my pleasure to be here to share with you today to take part in this year's virtual edition of the SDG Business Forum and to bring these welcoming remarks and reiterate our commitment to working together for sustainable development. Rising temperatures, droughts, flooding, and natural disasters have posed an existential threat to small businesses and millions of livelihoods. At the same time, COVID-related shutdowns and supply chain shocks have only exacerbated these challenges. Yet I'm still optimistic. Why? Because we have a private sector that is increasingly being empowered with a heightened awareness of their role as partners to accelerate sustainable development. We know that MSMEs contribute both directly and indirectly to sustainable development goals. So it makes sense to strengthen their ability to become game changers in the respective sectors and countries in which they operate. The UN Secretary General annual report on SDG progress was clear that globally we are in a precarious place. The call was made to quote, use the recovery to adopt low carbon resilient and inclusive development pathways that will reduce carbon emissions, conserve natural resources, create better jobs, advance gender equality, and tackle growing inequities, close quote. The report also urged us to quote, put clean and sustainable energy at the heart of the COVID-19 response and fight against climate change. Being from Jamaica, I could not agree more with this call. Climate resilience is not just a buzzword for a country's like mine. It is essential for our very existence. We must pivot and do better. One way to do this is by supporting environmentally responsible trade what we at ITC call good trade. However, adopting sustainable business practices is not always easy. To enable businesses to adopt such practices, they need to see the immediate benefits, meaning that the business case needs to be clear, and it is. A thrust towards sustainability equals major opportunities for MSMEs. As shown in our flagship publication, the SME Competitiveness Outlook, becoming climate resilient makes companies more competitive. They can reduce production and operational costs and benefit from new business opportunities, such as new product lines. Climate resilient solutions and green technology provide untapped business opportunities. At the same time, adhering to sustainability standards improves their reputation and image with buyers and consumers. So creating a business case for climate adaptation measures can also unlock new types of financing opportunities, which are crucial for the successful implementation of adaptation measures. However, MSMEs from developing countries often need support to reap these benefits. This is why we will continue supporting enterprises to get ready for the new green normal by developing inclusive and environmentally responsible business models and supply chains. We assist young emerging entrepreneurs who are innovating on green products and services with specific focus on women, local communities, and indigenous people. 
To facilitate access to finance, we support MSMEs to develop bankable sustainability projects, preparing them to become ready for green investments. And to further strengthen our work on the ground, ITC introduced its new Green to Compete initiative in 2020. With a focus on climate change, circularity, and biodiversity, Green to Compete coaching programs offer tools and solutions for SMEs to build their capacity and knowledge to seize green business opportunities. We also focus on fostering sustainability and through the tech sector. ITC supports not only the development of digital entrepreneurs and tech startups through training and connections, but also ensures that their business case, cases have a green focus. For example, in Uganda, we coach MSMEs which are optimizing solar energy systems to extend their lifespan through data analytics. We also support agribusinesses to improve farming practices through the application of smart sensors for irrigation. By supporting MSMEs to adopt resource efficient and circular production methods, we increase their climate resilience and decrease their production costs through better management of energy, water, and waste. This improves the chances of business continuity and increases their resilience to external shocks. We look forward to deepening our collaboration with other UN agencies and of course partners like the ICC and the IFC to accelerate the achievement of sustainable business and promote good trade. By working together, we can ensure that our collective sustainability and inclusiveness initiatives can be ramped up to contribute to poverty alleviation and improve livelihoods. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pamela and Mokhtar, for such great introductions. Now it's time to begin our panel discussion. Please welcome our moderator, Natasha Mudhar, founder of The World We Want, a global social impact enterprise. Hi, everybody. Um, joining today's session, part of the UN Global Compact's Unger Week Uniting Business Live event. My name is Natasha Mudhar. I'm the founder of the global impact enterprise, WWW, The World We Want. And I'm really honored to be moderating this really exciting and important session, Micro SMEs Paving the Way to a Sustainable Economy. Now, joining me today are an esteemed panel of speakers. And we've got stalwarts from the world of business, trade, climate consulting, and policy. Just to share some very quick background on myself. So my journey with the SDGs began in 2014, when I took on the role of India Director to launch and popularize the goals to India's 1.3 billion population. Now, that's one sixth of the world's population. And there's no surprise why the world can only achieve its SDG targets if India achieves theirs. Now, like many of today's panelists and everybody speaking at um, this week's um, uh, business, Uniting Business Live events, um, my purpose and mission is to accelerate progress to achieving the UN's SDGs, especially as we have less than 10 years to meet our targets. But before we can achieve the goals, it's fundamental to remember that you can only fight for your rights if you know what your rights are. And that's why we need to be aware of the goals and they need to be understood to encourage any form of meaningful action. So this particular notion of converting awareness into inspired action became my impetus to establish the world we want. And at W, we leverage the power of purpose. We spearhead our own initiatives, including those that are fundraising related. We launch major global communication strategies, and we also help define CSR programs for various organizations and businesses as part of our responsible business program aligned to the SDGs. So here we help leaders to realize how they can truly do well by doing good. But most importantly, we accelerate progress by unlocking the collaborative potential of multi-sector stakeholders, which means convening change makers and citizens, nonprofits and philanthropists, governments and institutions, celebrities to thought leaders and entrepreneurs to businesses, including the micro SME and SME community. This takes me to the theme of today's session. We will outline the importance of SMEs and micro SMEs towards creating future sustainable growth to help achieve the SDGs. Now, according to the World Bank, SMEs account for 90% of business, 50% of employment worldwide, and up to 40% of GDP in emerging economies. As for MSMEs, East and South Asia hold the largest number, naturally due to the population base, but Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America are emerging as the fastest growing regions for the MSME community. So the way MSMEs develop into their businesses affects the world around us, it affects each and every one of us, and that's why we need to make them important allies in our fight to achieve the SDGs. 
and to pave the way to a sustainable economy that's also resilient. And that's literally means putting people, planet, profit center stage. In today's session, we're gonna hear from our panelists on the importance of thought leading strategies and to strengthen the resilience of communities to withstand future shocks and to become more sustainable. We will also learn how MSMEs especially can benefit from pushing sustainability higher on their responsible business agenda. So let's start by meeting today's panelists. All of them are incredible and inspiring leaders in their respective sectors, and I'm delighted to introduce each and every one of them. Now, following the introductions, we'll move on to the Q&A segment of the session today. So I'd like to begin by introducing Ms. Flora Mutahi. She's a board member at UN Global Compact and the CEO of Melvin Marsh International, which is Kenya's largest flavored tea company. Ms. Mutahi is also the current chairperson for the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, and she's the first female to occupy this role since its inception 57 years ago. Flora, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you're with us. Um, I know you had a little bit of audio trouble. Yes. So you have a very, yes, wonderful. So you have a very inspiring business journey and one that would inspire many, many young girls and women to have the courage to venture into a more non-conformist professions. We'd really like to know more about your work and especially what encouraged you to launch the Women in Manufacturing program, which I think you launched late last year. Thank you very much and um, greetings from Africa, Kenya in particular, the Eastern side. Um, basic, basically, I've always been very passionate about being um, an entrepreneur. For me, my journey was difficult. When I started um, 25 years ago, nobody really wanted to listen to somebody who's gone through a proper education and you say you want to get into business. It was not cool. And so from there, then I really got a passion for entrepreneurship. And then when I became the chair of um, Kenya Association of Manufacturers at that time, um, it became clear to me that there were very few um, um, women in manufacturing. And that is why we decided with the then CEO to, to actually put to house a program called Women in Manufacturing, where we empower the women, we, we, we help capacity build, and more importantly, we build linkages with the larger businesses. Because you tend to find a lot of women manufacture, but um, not at scale. So you do a little side hustle. And we said, listen, why don't we scale up the businesses? So that's where my passion really, really came from. And to date, I still mentor and, um, you know, support women in manufacturing entrepreneurs. That's wonderful. That's absolutely lovely to hear. So I've now got Mr. Ian Talbot. He now he's the chief executive of Chambers Island and ICC Island, which is in Ireland's largest business organization. I'd just like to take a short moment to mention that today's session is co-hosted by ICC, which is the global corporate organization, and that represents over six and a half million companies, chambers of commerce and business associations in over 130 countries. The objective of ICC is to promote trade, international investment, as well as the policies and measures aimed at facilitating international operation of these companies. Now, Ian is responsible for driving the future growth and strategic development of the organization in Ireland, and it seeks to promote the competitiveness of business in Ireland, represents its members, and facilitates the development of the Chamber Network. Ian, it's such a pleasant pleasure to have you with us on this panel. Could you start by telling us some more about the mission and the vision of the ICC in Ireland, and in particular, your work with the MSME community? Absolutely, and thanks very much, Natasha, for the introduction. I think what's what's key to us is to be a funnel of information for SMEs and MSMEs. Um, the ICC globally is an observer member of the United Nations, for example, and is heavily invested, as you are, Natasha, in the SDGs. So we have an incredible amount of information from our chambers and our ICC operations around the world. The most important thing for us is to act as the funnel, to take all that information, to distill it into relevant things that could work for Irish companies and make sure we communicate that. And some of the key big areas that we tend to look at are the areas, first of all, of education, secondly, the area of self-help, and finally, the areas of recognition. I know we're going to talk some more later in the discussion about particular programs we have. But for me, the big thing is to follow the vast array of information that's out there about what people might be able to do and convert that into, some, to, into, into things that people can really deliver locally. And that's our big opportunity and our big challenge is to distill that information and make it usable. Yeah, so when you're talking about information, it's, it's truly 
power is uh, knowledge is truly pow powerful there. So no, thank you for that, Ian, and look forward to speaking to you again in this session. Um, next on the panel, we have uh, Ruka uh, Sanusi. She's the executive director of Clim uh, Ghana Climate Innovation Center, which is a pioneering clean tech and green business incubator housed in the As uh, Asesi University and funded through a grant from the World Bank's InfoDev Climate Technology Platform. Now, Ruka is a skillful management consultant professional with over 20 years of international consulting experience in the UK and Africa, with particular knowledge of business management, strategy development, and organizational transformation. Ruka, I was reading your biography and it's, it's impressive to say the least. You have a global influence and I've worked across and you know several different sectors, including the areas of sustainability and climate change. Um, could you tell us what inspired you into this particular field and how you're empowering the efforts of MSMEs committed to furthering Ghana's green agenda? Thank you so much, Natasha, and uh, good morning to uh, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on where you are um, in the world. I mean, for me, my inspiration really um, stems from, number one, being a business uh, management consultant and really just being, um, I get very excited about solving, solving business and problems. But, you know, realizing that SMEs contribute um, which about 80% of Ghana's GDP and most countries in Africa is, is, is the same thing. But they don't really have um, access to um, really strong and good business advisory services. And, you know, for me, it was a, a case of how will they grow? How will they grow their businesses? How will they scale their businesses um, to, you know, to really know business success? Um, many SMEs start with very passionate, you know, about what it is that, that they do. But you know, without access to finance, the right business advisory services, the right technical support, they may not be able to, um, to do that. My particular interest in sustainability and, and climate change for the business sector is just because you know, the marketplace is, is, is changing. You know, there is a climate em emergency which business and private enterprise needs to respond to. And the, the fact is manu our manufacturing and processes, our operational procedures, these are some of the things that are causing green, greenhouse gas emissions. And you'd be surprised at how many you know, um, SMEs, MSMEs are not really aware of how their, their own business is, is contribution to this. So it's, it, for me, it was really um, one thing to help people to uh, arrive at their business nirvana and, and really you know, meet their business goal, but also to do so um, with a planet in mind. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's interesting, uh, Ruka, where you talk about the impact that um, you know M MSMEs, especially in the Ghana region or Af wider Africa region, are making. But do you also think that they can also display a lot of leadership as well? I'm, I'm a very, I'm massively passionate about the global south and really projecting the global south's leadership, and yeah. you know, hate the whole notion of global north and the south relationship being very transactional when it could be very transformative. But do you also see that uh, you know continents like Africa and we, you know countries like Ghana can actually display a lot of leadership when it comes to uh, defining the green agenda globally, not just on a pan-Africa level. Oh, right. very much so, Natasha. I very much agree with you um, on that. You know, our mission at Sheffield University is to raise ethical entrepreneurial leaders with the courage to transform the continent. So it's really um, raising um, a group of people, you know, who have the passion for the continent, um, who, who, who want to be leaders, not, not political leaders only, but, you know, business leaders, you know, and leaders in, in, in science, in, in, in engineering, whatever it is, to transform this continent. So the potential is there, but you know, the, the support is needed um, from, the, from the government sector, from the donor community, um, to, you know, to, to really help these um, businesses and these, and these um, new generation leaders to actually you know, deliver uh, what is already in, in, in inside of them. Thank you, Ruka, thank you. So we're also joined by um, Nicolas uh, Urebe. He's the chair of ICC Columbia. Now, Nicolas is also a lawyer from Los Andes University with studies in international politics from the American University of Washington, DC, public policy of the high government school from Los Andes University, and a master's degree in political action and citizen participation, the rule of law. Now, he's held important positions in public and private sectors throughout his career. And in 2020, he was elect selected as vice president for Latin America as 
for the World Chambers Federation. During his years of public service, Nicolás developed policies for the inclusion of Colombian youth, social control programs to promote transparency and the implementation of public resources and initiatives to promote youth ventures with an emphasis on business creation. And Nicholas, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Now, from your profile, you appear to be at that intersection point between the private and public sector and creating impact on so many, so many different levels. And I, I'm, as you, as I mentioned earlier in my, from my profile as well, I'm a very big believer about unlocking multi-sector stakeholder partnerships, whether it's the public sector or private, because when you come together, you know, nothing could be impossible. So in your context, you know, you've mobilized the youth to engage the business community. And I would love to hear more details on your professional background and the, you know, the sort of impacts you've made that you're particularly proud of. Well, I believe that today we have the opportunity to make a point. And that the point is that being in business and uh, it's basically being sustainable. And that's what we are think uh, we are facing right now. It's the opportunity to uh, utilize, uh, uh, to use the aspect of sustainability uh, in the world to make uh, a better business uh, environment. Of course, 97% of businesses are micro, small, and medium-sized companies. And they have limited resources and uh, they need a very big support to make a better uh, uh, commitments uh, to sustainability in, in our time. So that's why I believe uh, chambers of commerce are very important in, the, in, in, in that goal. So one of the things that uh, I think it's uh, very interesting right now, it's the opportunity to promote uh, uh, companies uh, of benefit and uh, collective interest. Those are companies that are voluntarily intending to advance in their commercial and activity, of course, but also with the, uh, the very intimate action uh, uh, with uh, the advantages of uh, promote well-being on the environment. Uh, these companies are redefining businesses everywhere and uh, making a lot of actions and uh, trying to disrupt the economic model of their businesses and uh, creating economic and uh, environmental value all the time. Uh, this project that we are leading right now, which uh, make uh, many uh, SMEs, uh, big companies, uh, companies of uh, interest and benefit and collective benefit, uh, reduce the, the 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 impact on the environment, and also they are the only way to make them sustainable in the future. Uh, other issues like, uh, for example, uh, working on production and training and, and trade sustainable projects are very important because uh, clients all over the world not only are seeking for companies that are working well for them, but also which are very sustainable and that uh, act uh, in, in accordance to, to, to the world's uh, uh, best practices of uh, sustainable uh, action in the economic arena. No, that's amazing, um, Nicolas. And, and it's interesting to see how you're blending purpose and profit you know, on the same level here as well, when you're talking about scaling up businesses and transforming a MSME into a bigger organization. But at the same time, when you're kind of, you know, developing, you know, scripting that pathway for them, you're making them very purpose minded at the same time as being very profitable as well. So that's that's wonderful. Now we are going to be moving on to our question Q&A segment of today's session. And I'm going to go straight into it and ask a question. So here's the overarching question. Um, and I'll just personalize it to each, each of our panelists. So how can local chambers and business associations support their smaller members, particularly MSMEs, in understanding and adopting sustainable business practices? Now, I'd like to begin by asking Ian's views. As someone leading Ireland's largest business organization, It'd be great if you could share some of the ways uh, the ICC in Ireland are supporting and educating SME owners about how they can be sustainable without necessarily uh, foregoing profits, particularly as businesses took, you know, look to bounce back from the economic downturn as a result of COVID. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Natasha. And uh, we, we're already overlapping in terms of things we're talking about. So, for example, where Nicola was talking about public-private partnerships, one of the things we've done is we're engaged with, in a public-private partnership arrangement with a government training agency called Skillnet to build climate-ready programmes uh, that already uh, a year into existence have helped a 1,000 companies and 3,000 staff to get more climate ready. But it's obviously a lot more than just climate ready. There's a big challenge for us all that people don't conflate the climate change has just been it. The goals are obviously a huge amount wider. Um, so we're also looking at a whole range of other things. So we've introduced a toolkit, for example, uh, that's available freely on our website uh, that gives companies a, a whole process, practical experience, and the ability to identify who you need to engage with, how to make progress, if you like project management expertise around how to build your program and how to deliver it. Um, a final thing that, that uh, I wanted to talk about is we do awards. And it's one of those things where it can seem, it, this is really serious what we're talking about. So is it right to be giving awards to people? Of course it is. Awards are a great encouragement. We need individuals within companies to take ownership and action as well as the companies themselves. So we've been running the Sustainable Business Impact Awards uh, for several years now in Ireland. Uh, they cover a, a range, the awards cover a range of things from community to um, working on your supply chain, diversity and inclusion, uh, volunteering, a whole range of things. And more so than normal business awards, there's real ownership by the people who delivered the projects rather than the company itself. So you have this great sense of belonging for the, the individuals who can then go home and take those learnings from their company home, their individual private lives and make changes too. So you know, things like awards can be really valuable to let people know that what they're doing uh, really matters. So those, those are some of the things we're doing. And again, we'll talk more about the scalability of some of these, these programs perhaps later on. No, I'm all for awards. They're great storytelling opportunities. And as you said, Ian, as well, it also helps set benchmarks, create more accountability, inspire others. I mean, you look up to individuals who've won these awards and you aspire to also follow their footsteps as well. So I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. Uh, I'm going to move on to Ruka. And it'd be great to hear your thoughts on how MSME owners can be supported and educated about sustainable practices. Now, as somebody who specializes in business management and strategy development, do you think this knowledge is lacking amongst MSMEs business owners? Uh, do you think they, they approach this more as a cost uh, rather than a positive investment that they can reap benefits um, from in the long term? Thanks, Natasha. I think definitely um, they see it as a cost. And um, But, you know, the, the, the overarching thing is we, for us at the Ghana Climate Innovation Center, we found that even general awareness of what sustainable business means in practice is extremely useful for small and growing businesses. So we have hosted practical workshops and sessions on what climate change is, how the business sector has contributed to it and is continuing to contribute to it, and how possibly you know, their own enterprise is contributing to climate change and some of the, some of the items that you know, we have found that enterprises really, really find valuable as we implement our national road, uh, business roadshows where we go all over Ghana, uh, meeting the regional capitals with startups, with um, entrepreneurs, with MSMEs, and we really advocate for you know, um, climate action you know, in the business sector. SMEs want to succeed. They want to go the long haul with their business. And the, but they realize the potential risk to their business sustainability in the long run you know, if they do not um, adapt their, their business practices. So they want to take action. The, the question is, you know, how? I'll give you an example very quickly about, a, about a, a fashion business. You might think, what's that going to do with sustainability? Well, here it is. You know, it's, you have a, a successful um, fashion business here in Ghana. And um, the, the founder and the co-founder are saying to me, look, you know, we, we, we do quite well, you know, $400,000 um, a, a year revenues. You know, but how do we even know what our carbon footprint is? How do we calculate it? How do we reduce it? You know, what are the sustainable textiles? Who manufactures them? How can we get access to them? Are they affordable? So these are the kind of practical things that we find that um, we are having to support 
businesses that um, want to you know, tra transition to low carbon pathways or are already transitioning, helping them with the practical um, support that they need, whether that's advisory, whether that's you know, um, technical support or whatever it is um, to make that tra transition to um, low carbon manufacturing processes and you know, having a sustainable business. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you, Ruka. Nicholas, in your capacity of being chair of ICC Columbia, how can an organization like yours help smaller members understand and adopt sustainable business practices? Well, I think that's one of the best and most important issues that we have uh, today in mind. And uh, I believe that, that there are many ways of uh, working with them and trying to uh, adopt uh, uh, development uh, sustainable goals and development goals and uh, that's one of the main issues that the chamber can uh, not only promote but help them uh, 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 adopt uh, internally uh, as i said before the skills and the level of development of smes is uh, sometimes very very low and uh, what we can do is not only lecture them about how to uh, be informed about them, but how to implement them in the real in the real world, uh, and uh, basically that's uh, about uh, not only convincing them, but uh, trying to show them that uh, if they adopt them, they will not only be uh, in a good uh, situation in the economic uh, in, in the economic uh, uh, environment but also they will be sustainable in the future. Because I just, uh, as I just said before, uh, sustainable, uh, it's uh, the name of the game today, of the nature of a business on the 21st century. It's not only about how to be successful, uh, making uh, money to survive, but how to be successful uh, to working with the environment and being able to uh, survive uh, helping others and uh, being not uh, only in the purpose of uh, making business, but also to help in the environment work. So uh, there are many, many uh, possibilities to work with SMEs around. Uh, one of them, it's uh, of course uh, working in uh, many workshops uh, and showing them uh, business examples of uh, success uh, uh, factors. And of course, uh, trying to make their DNA uh, part of the change by adopting sustainable and uh, sustainable. Well, and, and, and I guess truly just demonstrating that, you know, doing well by doing good, by doing, doing well and being, you know, thriving economically and making those profits, you can actually be giving back to society in multiple levels as well. That's wonderful. Thank you, Nicholas. And finally, Flora, we'd love to hear your thoughts in the context of your work with the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. Now, does your organize comprise of many MSMEs? I, I presume they do, and I think you, you mentioned they did. And how do you empower their efforts? Thank you very much. Yes, we do have a, a very large base um, of MSMEs. In fact, we've, um, we actually built a, created a hub, a business hub, where we help them upskill and do several, several um, programs. And I think to your question around how do we help them promote, um, promote the SDGs, I would say, first of all, the first thing we're able to do is help them promote um, SDG number five, which is um, gender equality. Um, because they're on, often almost discriminated against, and uh, especially in a situation like this during COVID, they're, they're the worst hit. So we were able to quickly come together, put a mentorship program together, and uh, mutual supporting and women like speak conversations. So through those conversations, we're able to help them build back better, be resilient, pivot, and uh, you know, sort of give them that support. Decent work and economic growth, um, SG, DG8. Um, business associations, again, we've been able to improve, help them improve their opportunities. For example, when supply chains got challenged, we were able to turn around and Kenyan government was one of those that turned around and said, you know what, we're not going to import masks. We're going to support the SME. They went to the fashion um, council and put together a whole lot of um, SMEs, helped them build their standards. And the government bought and supported a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the masks that were there. Access to finance is another um, area that um, we, through the MasterCard Foundation, we have a program where we give them $1.5, well, $15,000, um, you know, with, with interest-free, repayable within a certain period of time. 
Um, so we've given them the access to market, access to market or whatever, and we do a lot of policy and advocacy for them. Industry Innovation and Infrastructure, which is um, SDG9, because they bring their issues to the to the association, we are able to, to you know to articulate them and take them up to government and say, hey, how do we help these um, MSMEs, you know, build their sectors, improve their value chain, and basically propagate um, new solutions, reducing inequalities again by lobbying and um, capacity building for business, you know, through us, we're able to re reduce the inequalities and create level playing fields. For example, we are able to link them up with the larger organizations as possible suppliers. Um, supply chain um, area is an area we've played very big. Partnerships for the goals, again, you know, using our partnerships, the MasterCard Foundation, we're able to actually break down the green economy, the blue economy, the climate change, and make them see opportunities in business. And of course, even SDG 16, you know, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Um, us being an apex body, we are able to sort of um, um, articulate, like we said, their issues and help them um, to be able to have a platform to speak. So if anything, we during especially this period when the SME was really, really um, challenged and very frail and fragile, we held their hand and really made sure that they were able to pivot and really to survive. Uh, wow, um, Flora, because I, I love the way you integrated the goals into your business and actually demonstrated. It's one thing about asserting, yes, you know, we support goal SDG 5, but actually demonstrating how you accelerate progress to achieving those individual goals. That's phenomenal. And I think the more businesses that recognize how they probably don't even realize it themselves, but how much of an impact they are creating. But the more, the more we can kind of really convert that awareness and knowledge into real form of action. That's 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 such an important pathway to our success in achieving the SDGs. So no, thank you for that. Um, now our second question. So our top line question here is what scalable programs for bolstering MSME resilience exist at the local level within the ICC and the UNGC networks? Now I'm going to start with Nicholas um, with this question. So from your wealth of experience in, in the Latin America region, it'd be great to know more uh, of, of your experience? Well, I think there are many scalable initiatives that we work on ICC and the UN's GC network. But I, I would like to focus on one that it's, uh, it's very inspiring because uh, it's uh, about a volunteer component of thousands of people who are into a small business empowerment. The first one, it's uh, one program that it's called uh, Consultive Committees. Uh, where experts uh, share their knowledge and experience with the little companies' owners uh, and entrepreneurs uh, to guide their companies in times of, uh, of crisis. Uh, it's a scheme that uh, for a few months, uh, these volunteers accompany uh, enterprises, free of charge, of course, under a model of replication boards of directors or where they don't have a boards of the directors on the, or where they cannot, of course, pay uh, advisors uh, in times of crisis uh, because of the nature of uh, and the size of their companies. So this is uh, working very nice because it's absolutely scalable and uh, it has a lot of impact, not only in SMEs, but in the people who help them and understand them, how they work, and which is the base of the pyramid of, uh, of enterprises. And another version of this initiative, it's uh, our project, uh, which is uh, Companies in Mega Trajectory, which seeks uh, also to help companies uh, and company leaders uh, by a network or for in a network of, of more than 2,500 mentors uh, that uh, at the end of 2024 will be attending three uh, 36,000 companies all over Colombia, and they will help to promote them productivity levels and challenge this organization to grow very rapidly. This is free program. They participate uh, in all over the country. Uh, they are mid-sized companies. And of course, they create value around, around uh, uh, voluntary services and the understanding of the importance of the company. And the, 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 the approval of this kind of project is very high because it's uh, entrepreneurs and company leaders to company owners which uh, just don't have the opportunity to get uh, help from somewhere else 
or uh, so, someone that uh, really understands uh, what are the challenges of being an entrepreneur or a company owner during this time of crisis. So I believe this kind of uh, projects where you use uh, voluntary services, business leaders, experts, and work with SMEs and companies to help them get out of the crisis and uh, push productivity, it's the way to get uh, real results and of course uh, uh, to find a way to uh, close gaps around understanding the business community in the local levels. And that's great, Nicholas. Uh, I'm a big fan of volunteering and mentor mentoring as well. I think it's, it's such a fundamental way to share knowledge. So no, thank you for that. So, and Flora, we'd love to hear your insights on this. So from juggling both your hats as a board member at UNGC and then now current chairperson for Kenya Private Sector Alliance, uh, what would you have to say? All right. You, well, I mentioned that the one about financing and also the one about the training and mentorship. But one of the things that, um, there are two that, that we, we are very proud of that we did, which was um, basically we, we, the digital transformation. So what we did is an e-booster program where we actually got uh, 2,600 um, MSMEs and we trained them within six months. And on top of training them, then we put them on an e-commerce platform to help them begin their businesses or to promote their, to continue to promote their businesses. The second one that we were very proud about also was what we are calling an AJIRA program, where we partnered with the government of Kenya to help digitize government um, organizations. For example, we went to the judiciary and said, can we help you digitize your cases? Um, and they said yes. And, and of course, because the courts were going online at the time, it has actually helped speed up um, the case movement. And what has happened is um, we've just done a study that um, showed within, during the COVID period to now, we've actually managed to create 1.2 million jobs. So that is something that we're very, very excited about that we've been able to do. Again, through the local network of the UN, UNGC, one of the things that um, we're very, very keen about, of course, is the global supply chain, making sure that the SMEs are um, partner ready and, and we, we help de-risk them you know, where, where we, are, we are able to say link up with either a, a bigger a big organization or, 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 or with government. We help help um, do corporate governance training on issues like um, anti-counter, um, you know, um, corruption training, um, helping them build network, networks with different various stakeholders. So, um, of course, and finally, we have launched uh, with the UN Global Compact out in New York, an SME strategy. Um, which will focus on identifying various pathways to boost the contribution of the M M MSME, um, you know, th to help them scale. And through this strategy, we aim to enhance their engagement through targeted cross-cutting programs, leveraging on digital tools and value chains so that they can, we can help them reach scale. That's incredible. And Ian, I'd just like to move on to you now. I mean, have you launched any particular programs to bolster the resilience amongst the MSME community? Yes, we have uh, very much so. And I've already referred to things like the, the awards we've been running for several years. A few things I'd like to focus on is more how we make sure what we're doing is relevant. Uh, we've uh, established a sustainable business council, for example, uh, for a few years, which is the sustainability experts from businesses large and small across the country that give us advice on what's working and what's not working and what's useful and what's not useful. That's been really helpful uh, to us. Um, from an ICC perspective, uh, the ICC have the SME Climate Hub available for people to sign up to. So that's a very valuable tool, very sustainable. And another thing, uh, picking up on Flora's point as well, uh, when we make policy recommendations to government now, we frame those policy recommendations not in the traditional way around taxation or infrastructure. We actually start with the goal that we're actually seeking to achieve progress in and the measures we're seeking uh, uh, to, to meet those goals. So, you know, things like childcare, for example, could cover a multitude. Um, so those are some of the things we're doing to make this sustainable for the future. Thank you, Ian. Now, Ruka, it'd be great to hear if you've got any wider or more local perspectives as well. Yes, and thanks, Natasha. I mean, you know, I mean, for us, actually, our, our whole program is really about building resilience amongst the, um, the small and growing business sector. And one of the things that we've actually focused on, you know, in building re resilience 
um, is about supporting enterprises to think about you know, business continuity management and crisis management, right? You know, particularly you know, during the time of, of, of COVID, you know, I mean, COVID, um, it, it, it really stood to actually halt many businesses and cause many businesses to, to actually you know, um, terminate the operations. But the, the thing is, from a strategy point of view, how do you infuse you know, resilience into your business, um, your business planning and your business operations, whether that's you know, your, um, your HR, whether that's your, your operations, you know, your, your, your financing? I, I know that you know so many may say, but for the SME, you know they're faced with so many challenges. You know, are you talking about business continuity? And they talk about crisis management. That's just an, another additional thing for them to think about. Our response to that is that if they don't think about it now, they may not have a business in a few months you know, d d down the line. So really, for, you know, for, for us, our, our, our focus is not only providing financial grounds, not only providing. Um, support around, you know, um, that transition into low carbon manufacturing processes and operating processes, but really impacting the mindset and the tool set and the skill sets of, of, of business leaders to ensure that they can really go the long haul um, with their business and ensuring that they're demonstrating resilience in how they're thinking, how they're planning their businesses and how they're executing um, their business operations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I don't think we could ever have a session without mentioning COVID. So our third question is, uh, just love to hear all of your thoughts on uh, the impact that COVID has had, especially on the small business or micro uh, small bus uh, business community. So Flora, to begin with you, um, as a leading businesswoman, um, it'd be lo I'd love to hear whether you, if you saw the pandemic disproportionately impact women-led businesses more than their counterparts? Um, thank you very much. And I think the simple answer to that is um, based on the sector you're in, yes. Uh, of course, we know hospitality, transport, and um, some, some people, I mean, there were some sectors that were hit harder than others. But basically, we just took like for like because women's businesses tend to be smaller, they tend to be frailer, they tend to be a little more fragile. So I would definitely say women were hit more disproportionately. But remember, COVID was also about going back home. Who is responsible for the home? It's the woman. Um, so not only did she lose on that front, now she had another job on this front. And even coming back, they didn't, not everybody came back together at the same time. So perhaps we found the woman was also very, 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 very torn. So definitely, I would say that the, the women um, were, were definitely more affected than the rest. And I think in Kenya, we did find almost 50% of the SMEs did go through some cash flow, um, cash flow crisis and definitely were struggling to keep their, their business is open. But there's something interesting, notably about 5 to 6% of, this, of the small businesses did, did, did manage to actually grow within the period. It's a small number, but there were some that were able to pivot quickly and turn around. And, and be able to, to, you know, to recover. Another interesting statistic is um, most layoffs were re reportedly among micro SMEs, which is about 53%, but the smallest, um, the small businesses, 78% were actually able to maintain their employees. So you tend to find women being, perhaps maybe the revenues are not coming in, but no, I'm going to hold on to my SMEs because we're more nurturers than anybody, anybody else. And hopefully during the recovery process, um, the loyalty and everything will help the, the women businesses continue to grow. So I think it's very, it was very sector-based initially, um, and then definitely about the strength of the business and the foundation, which is why we, we've been mentoring and coaching the women to sort of bounce back and think differently because we don't know what's coming next. So the more resilient you build your business and the firmer your foundation, obviously, you'll be able to survive. Greetings and welcome to the SDG Business Forum brought to you by the United Nations, that's UNGC and UNDESA, and by the International Chamber of Commerce. My name is Pavan Sukhdev. I'm the Chief Executive of GIST, an SME, which works at the intersection of sustainability and technology. GIST is a partner of the International Chamber of Commerce, and together we bring to you a platform called SME 360X, which enables you to achieve and work towards sustainability. The sustainability that we seek, that you seek, is elusive, partly because it is the economy that is driving us in the direction towards planetary boundaries and 
as we know, two thirds of the economy is private sector, and actually two thirds of the private sector is SMEs. So not only are today's SMEs underserved because they don't have the help or the toolkit to measure and manage sustainability, but they are also a big part of the challenge that we have today of moving the economy, unfortunately, in the wrong direction. We can change all that. Together, we can first start by measuring sustainability, measuring our impacts, and then we can design strategies to change those impacts in order to enter those supply chains which favor sustainable companies and in order to attract those customers and those new millennials who favor SMEs who produce in a sustainable manner. But to do all of this, we first need to recognize the importance of the SDGs, which have become truly the single most important policy entry point when it comes to any business or for that matter, any sector working to change policies which align the way that support is provided to businesses, whether they are in the form of subsidies or whether they are in the form of grants. And also to provide direction to the economy, we need to look at sustainable development goals. The SDGs are all about achieving sustainable development, which means development that leaves no one behind and ensures that we leave a future world that is stable and healthy and safe for our children. To do that, we must begin to focus firstly on the foundational goals, as I call them, which is goal number six on fresh water, goal number 13, climate, which is the focus of everyone today. Uh, goal number 14, which is life in the ocean, life underwater, and goal number 15, which is life on land. Without achieving these goals, we cannot have a stable and sustainable agriculture, which is about goal number two. And without a sustainable agriculture, we cannot address poverty because Almost a billion people who are poor are employed in agriculture. Neither can we achieve health, goal number three, because at the end of the day, the food that we eat determines our health. Diets have become the number one cause of the global burden of disease. So we see that all of these SDGs are actually intertwined, but the heart and the center of those is the ecological SDGs, goals six, 13, 14, and 15, above whom rest the goals which are social goals, uh, such as one, two, three, four, and so on. And above them, finally, are the goals which are economic in nature, such as goal number eight on GDP and jobs and goal number 12 on sustainable consumption and production. All of the SDGs are complex and intertwined. We need to appreciate and embrace that complexity in order to succeed, and we must do this together. GIST and ICC bring you SME 360X, a platform that helps you measure and manage sustainability. We invite you to try out this platform and give us your feedback. We invite you to drive the change that we all seek in this world. So please, my request is log into the website of the ICC World Business Organization, iccwbo.org slash SME360x. That's iccwbo.org slash SME360x. And try this new platform. Give us your feedback, give us your ideas. Be the change that we all seek in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Pavan, Natasha, and our great panelists. That was an extremely valuable conversation for our audience, and especially our SME stakeholders in the audience today. Many of you commenting on the platform, talking about the need for SMEs to recognize the global opportunities out there, and also comments from Rosario and others talking about the importance of KPIs and measurement. Keep the conversation going.